Well, good morning and welcome to Calvary Chapel, Quincy, California. Turn with me in your Bibles this morning to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, as we continue our study through this book. The theme of the Gospel of Matthew is the Gospel of the King. And the key verse is Matthew 27, verse 37. This is Jesus the king of the Jews. And the gospel of Matthew, as you know, is, is the gospel of the king, and its focus is on, on Jesus as the king of the Jews. But Jesus is not only the king of the Jews, but the king of every man, every woman who will put their faith in him and his work on the cross, submitting to his authority as their king. We call Jesus our Lord and our Savior. Amen? Amen. And Lord implies that he's in charge, right? Lord implies that you let go of the steering wheel and let Jesus drive your life. Amen? I know that's hard. I like to drive the car. (laughs) But you know what? We need to let Jesus drive our life. Amen? Amen. Now in chapter 1, the heritage of the king was presented through the genealogy proving Jesus' legal right to be that king, the king of the Jews. In chapter 2, honor was paid to the king Wise men came from afar to worship Jesus as the long-awaited king of the Jews. In chapter 3, John the Baptist heralded the king as the Messiah, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the king of the Jews. In chapter 4, Satan challenged the king, but he was sent away by the very word of the king. And now, in chapter 5, the gospel of the king we see. This section starting in chapter 5 verse 1 through chapter 7 verse 29 is known as the Sermon on the Mount. And it's known as that because Jesus went up on a mountain in order to speak to the large multitude of people who had assembled uh, to hear him and to see him. And so we call this section the Sermon on the Mount. In fact, it's the longest of Jesus' sermons recorded for us in Scripture. And there are no other sermons of Jesus recorded anywhere else, by the way. Now, last week, we covered the first 12 verses which contain one of the most well-known teachings of Jesus called the Beatitudes. And and these are, are not, by the way, a blueprint for living as some think, but they are a declaration of the gospel and the happiness that comes when we respond to that gospel and receive Christ as our Lord and Savior. And, and this is the foundation of Jesus' teaching and preaching throughout his ministry. Now this morning, Jesus is going to tell us what the effect of having received that gospel message would be. And foremost, that effect of receiving Christ as our Lord and Savior, apart from being saved and not going to hell, which is a great thing, amen? Amen. But that effect, that effect is that we will have influence in the world around us. We ought to have influence in the world around us. There is no other reason for the church to exist here on earth than the influence we have for Christ in this world. And if we taste like the world, if we look like the world, if we act like the world, then our influence for Christ in this world is gone. Christians who think we need to be like the world to win the world are sadly mistaken. A recent Barna poll, and this is a, a, I mean, we're talking recent poll, this is May 10th, 2022. It was called the American Worldview Inventory. It reveals shocking results among pastors, those who lead churches in this nation. Only 37% of American pastors hold a biblical worldview. Only 37%. It's slightly better among senior pastors, 41%, but it all goes downhill from there. Only 28% of associate pastors hold a biblical worldview. Only 13% of youth pastors hold a biblical worldview. And only 12% of children's ministry pastors 
that only 4% of executive pastors, those would be administrative pastors. Most of them hold to some form of syncretism, which is a blending of, uh, of their own personal views on subjects along with the Bible. No wonder, no wonder only 2% of the population of the United States of America holds a biblical worldview. If we, the church, are not influencing this world for Christ, then this world will be lost to the Antichrist. And we, sadly, are watching this happen in our own generation. So with that introduction, let's get started this morning. If you're not already there, turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, starting in verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Notice right off, Jesus says, you, you are the salt of the earth. And that word you is emphatic in the Greek language of the New Testament. The emphasis is on you and what you are. He didn't say you will be salt. He didn't say you are becoming salt. He said if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are the salt of the earth. We are salt. We bring value. We bring flavor. We bring healing. And we prevent decay. These are the properties of salt. In ancient times, Salt was a valuable commodity. Roman soldiers were often paid in salt. Thus the saying, right? He's worth his salt. Or the other saying, he's not worth his salt, right? Speaking of the value of a person and, and, and their work effort. So salt was valuable. The value of Christians to their communities and the world at large cannot be overstated as we have seen in our own nation, as the church has declined in influence, as we have become less salty, our society has declined further and further into sin. We're going to need a revival to change the course of this nation. And we, the church, need to be salt to influence our community our county, our state, nation, and world for Christ. And and, and it all begins with each individual salt shaker in the church. Amen? Amen. You're all salt shakers if you're believers in Jesus Christ. You know, it was during the great Welsh revival of the 20th century that bars closed their doors due to a lack of customers because so many were saved and gave up alcohol. In fact, what led to the revival was a similar situation that we are seeing in our own nation today. The Welsh revival of 1904 and 1905 coincided, and listen carefully, it coincided with the rise of the labor movement, of socialism, and of a general disaffection with religion among the working class and youths. Seems very similar to what's going on in our nation today. So we we need to pray and and we need to be salt because we're either poised for a great revival or we are poised for great destruction. We, the church, need to be worth our salt as believers. Amen? Amen? We need to be worth our salt. Now second, salt adds flavor. It enhances the flavor of food. So too, as Christians, we ought to make our family, our workplace, our neighborhood a better place because we are there. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, it says, Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge 
in every place. So we ought to enhance every place, every area of society we interact with. We ought to leave a good taste in the mouths of people that we contact. Amen? Amen. Not a bad taste. That includes phone solicitors. (laughs) I hate those guys. Sorry, I gotta work. I gotta work on that, just like you do. Now, third, third, salt has healing properties. Saline or sterile salt is used in wound care to prevent bacteria from growing. It, th- thus, it prevents infection. But if you've ever put regular salt on an open cut, you find out it stings. So too, as Christians, we need to speak the truth in love to those we know and society in general. Healing can't take place without acknowledging the injury. Our society is sick with sin, and we need to tell the patient the truth, but the truth so often stings. But like an uncooperative patient, society doesn't always want to hear the truth about its condition. But for those who will listen, those who will receive the remedy, they will be healed when they receive Christ as their Lord and Savior. So we need to be salt for the healing of sin. Fourth, salt is used as a preservative. It prevents decay, especially in meats. Without the influence of Christians society would rapidly decay until all that's left is the foul stench of sin. In fact, this is exactly what we are seeing and literally smelling today in our major cities. The foul stench of sin as homelessness and drug use lay on the sidewalks day after day. Government policy no longer guided or influenced by Judeo-Christian principles is unable and unwilling to help those affected. Our schools have also now decayed as well. We used to have the best educational system in the world. But now our educators are more concerned with pronouns, and, and I think there's like 78 of them now. Who can keep track of that? They're more concerned with promoting gender dysphoria. That's, by the way, that's a psychiatric condition where someone wants to be a gender other than their biological gender at birth. Our schools are promoting this, and not not here in our county necessarily. I'm speaking in general. So if you're involved in our school system here, don't be offended. But in general, across our nation, In addition, racist theories are taught and promoted that divide us, that pit us one against another, one class against another, one race against another. Again, when Judeo-Christian principles are no longer guiding and influencing our decisions, the result is decay. The result is decay. Christians must Stand up. I want you to listen to this, church. Christians must stand up. Christians must get involved. Christians can no longer be silent. We can no longer be the silent majority or I think probably more likely the silent minority in this nation. The recent Barna poll I quoted earlier says that one group scored higher than pastors in holding a biblical worldview. It is the spiritually active, governance-engaged, conservative Christians. A full 46% of this group, and these are Christians who are, who are involved, who get involved, a full 46% of this group 
holds a biblical worldview. Uh, the, the Bible guides their view of the world. It's like they see the world through glasses that, that are from their Bible, you see. So they understand sin, uh, God, man, uh, all those things through the lens of the Bible, not through the lens of changing society, but through the lens of God's unchanging word. Now, some of you were here when they tried to allow commercial growing of marijuana in Plumas County. You remember that? Several of you, several of you sitting here this morning got involved, organized, attended meetings, formed strategy, spoke with elected officials. We, the church, stood up. We, the church, let our voices be heard and fought against the destruction that such a policy would have brought. And because we stood up, we won that battle. But unless we continue to stand up and continue to influence our society, decay will result. We are the only thing holding back decay. And when the church is taken out of this world at the rapture, the Antichrist will have free reign in this world, and this world will descend within seven years to destruction, complete and utter destruction. We are the only thing holding that back right now. Jesus went on to say in verse 13, He said, but, that's a word of contrast, you are the salt of the world, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. In Jesus' day, salt was the product of salt marshes. And, and it wasn't pure. It was mixed with other minerals. And, and when the salt became leached out of, of a batch of that, and the mineral content uh, became greater than the salt, it, it became flat and, and tasteless. And, and then you couldn't just throw it on your garden or in your field. It would kill the plants. And so the only place you could throw that uh, to get rid of it was on the walking pathways and the road. It's good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. When the church is no longer pure, no longer salty, it is no good to anyone. As individual believers, when we allow more of the world to mix into our lives and less of God's Word, we become less salty, less useful to God for His purpose in this world. The decay we are seeing in our nation today is the direct result of the loss of influence the church is having on our society. I think, and, and, and this is just my observation from being a believer for 45 years and a pastor for 18 years, I think when the church began to compromise the truth of God's Word in order to be acceptable to society, that's when we began to lose our influence Amen. with society. Amen. Amen. So church... So church, Calvary Chapel, Quincy, our YouTube audience out there. According to Jesus, you are the salt of the earth. So stay salty. Stay salty. Bring value, bring flavor, healing, and preservation to the society around you. Be individual salt shakers. Amen? Amen. As well as corporate salt shakers as a body of believers. Now let's look at verses 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So not only are we salt, but we are the light of the world. 
The word you is once again emphatic. This is what you are in Christ. If Christ is in you, then His light will shine through you and bring illumination to a dark and desperate world. That's the whole purpose of light, by the way. It's to illuminate. Jesus said a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Uh, Christians are not called to hide their faith, but to display their faith in everyday situations of life. When we live out our faith, where others can see it. We're like a city set on a hill. Everyone can see it. Conversely, when we put it under a basket, when we hide our faith, or worse, when our light is so dim that we look like the dark, lost world around us, then we're not fulfilling our purpose as Christians. Our purpose is to light the way to Christ. Jesus said our light should be put on a lampstand and it gives light to all who are in the house. In other words, our faith is to be lived out for all the world to see. Mankind should benefit from the light that is in us. My uh, first job after getting out of the service as a young man was working in the warehouse at Surfer Magazine in uh, Southern California, down in San Juan Capistrano. On my very first day on the job, this is my first day, I went to lunch at a restaurant that was nearby. And, and I was reading my Bible over lunch, uh, which was my, my custom. And, and all of a sudden, the Lord spoke to me. And he wanted me to share the gospel. And, and, and so I asked him, I said, well, with who, Lord? You know, I'm in this restaurant. With who? with all of them I said to the Lord you know what you're going to have to confirm that one (laughs) I'm going to need more than that buddy (laughs) the very next passage of scripture I read I'm reading I'm sitting there reading the very next passage I read was you are the light of the world a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a lampstand and it gives light to all who are... That's the very next verse I read. Now as I was debating this with the Lord, in walk, in walk, several executives from Surfer Magazine to have lunch. And they picked a booth right in the center of the restaurant and sat down. I thought, great, this is my last day on the job. <laughs> so I said, I said, Lord, I said... When do you want me to do this? I was hoping it was like, well, pay your bill, be ready. You can can get right out the door when you're done, you know. When do you want me to do this? And he said, now. (laughs) So I got up. I walked to the center of that restaurant. I turned and faced the table where those executives were seated. And I preached the gospel. I told them God loved them, died for their sins. Then I went, stood there almost trembling, paid my bill, (laughs) went back to work. I worked there for about six months, and I left for uh, that job to go to Bible college. Uh, But I went back to visit after having been gone for a while, and and one of the guys that worked for me, I was kind of the warehouse manager uh, when I left, but this man came up to me, and he wasn't even a believer. But he came up to me, and, and he took me out into the warehouse, and he showed me uh, there were dirty posters hung everywhere. There was a mannequin with a joint in its mouth up on a cabinet. Uh, and he said to me, he said, Rob, he said, if you were still here, none of this stuff would be here. None of this stuff would be here. And you know what? I never told anyone, don't do this or don't do that. But I was notorious for sharing my faith frequently and openly. Everyone knew where I stood. In fact, if someone cussed in the warehouse when I was in there, they put and they saw me, they put their hand over their mouth and they apologized immediately. Because they knew where I stood. Because of Christ in me, you see, I had influence in that place where I worked. 
As Christians, we can influence our society for good if we will only let our light shine in the darkness. But we can't be darkness to let light shine, amen? We have to walk in the light as He is in the light in order to allow that light to shine. But if we hide our light, then we're no use to Christ and no help to society. So Jesus says, let, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. We're called to let our light shine before men. We're called to be candlesticks for Christ, to be lights in this dark world, to light the way to Christ. That light must be lived out and seen by men in order to be of any use to men. You know, what good is the most powerful flashlight if you never turn it on? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Our good works are not done to draw attention to ourselves or even to our church or organization. They're done to glorify our Father in heaven. We shine our light. We do good works for the glory of God so that men and women will be drawn to Christ. No doubt, no doubt there are more good works that we as believers need to be involved in. But just make sure those good works glorify the God of the Bible, the Father in heaven, and that they're not part of some movement that seeks to, to, to draw all religions together. There is only one God and one biblical faith, we as believers in Christ have nothing in common with the cults or idol-worshiping religions of this world. The light we shine is the Bible light. And the salt we bring is the Bible salt. Amen? Amen. Leave the one world religion to the Antichrist and false prophet. That's their work. Our world our nation, our communities are suffering from the decay caused by sin. We see it and we read about it each and every day. Their only hope is Christ and we are the means to bring Christ to the world. This world is in the shape that it's in because the church has compromised the faith. We have allowed the world to influence the church instead of the church influencing the world. Amen. We, the church, need to get salty in these last days. Amen? Amen? We, the church, need to shine brightly in these last days. And we are, by the way, in the last days. If we fail to influence our generation for Christ then they will turn to the Antichrist. He will promise to be the Savior of the world and mankind will follow and believe Him. So before we close today, I, I just want to encourage you, church. Don't be, first of all, don't be like the world. The world is in an advanced state of decay. And if you don't know that, just read Romans chapter 1. The world is dying. It's on life support. Don't live, don't act, don't speak like the world. Rather, be like Jesus. Live like Jesus. Act like Jesus. Speak like Jesus. You are the salt of the earth, and you are the light of the world. Live like it and you will have influence for Christ on the slice of world around you. Amen? Each of us lives in a little slice of our community, a slice of our family, a slice of our workplace, a slice of our, our, our county and area, our neighborhoods. 
Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. We'll have the worship team come back up. Father, we, uh, we so thank you for your word. Thank you, Jesus, for having spoken these words, not only to the disciples to whom you spoke them, but to us through your word today. And I pray, God, that we will take your word to heart, that each and every one of us in our own uh, environment, in our own area, will have influence for you, that we will be salty, that we will bring uh, value and healing, preservation, flavor even to the areas in which we live, Lord, that no one would have a bad taste in their mouth because of us, but rather, rather they would see something in us that was so appealing. I was thinking, Lord, that, that salt also makes one thirsty. And Lord, may the world around us be thirsty for our Lord, thirsty for our Savior, as we become those salt shakers. And then, Lord, help us not to hide our faith, but to live our faith out loud where all can see it. And I know, Lord, that in doing so, we also attract uh, sometimes the wrong attention, sometimes persecution, sometimes ridicule. Uh, but, Lord, some will also be drawn to the light and be saved and that's your purpose for us here and so lord may your purpose be fulfilled in each and every one of our lives and and help us once again lord help us to take these things to heart to not just hear this sermon to hear this message this morning and to leave thinking well what a wonderful sermon but our lives don't change lord may we think about this. May we consider it and may you by your Holy Spirit work in our hearts and lives to make us salty and to make us shine brightly. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 We'll sing a final song. You know, in order to, to shine for Jesus,